Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Sometimes you got to get outside your tent. You got to get some new perspective. You got to go somewhere. You got to get by yourself. You got to do a little dreaming. You got to get a little vision. You can't just stay in same old, same old, same old, dealing with problem, 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 problem. Now I want us to look at a biblical example of the power of keeping a vision in front of you. The power of what you see physically but also spiritually. You know, I think that we don't take enough time to just sit and think. We don't take enough time to, uh, to see things, to dream on purpose. What do you see? Do you only see what's in front of you? More dishes, more diapers, more trash. More bills, more grouchy people, more, more, more. Jacob is a very interesting guy in the Bible, and you'll just have to let me tell you about him. But Esau was born first, but Jacob came out holding onto his heel as if to already say, I'm going to be first and get ahead of you in life. And actually, he was a trickster, a swindler, a sneak, a liar, and He was always conniving to get what he wanted. He didn't know how to wait on God to get him what he wanted. He was always conniving trying to get what he wanted. So he actually cheated Esau out of his birthright, the blessing prayer of the firstborn when the father died. And uh, through some real trickery, Esau was a real hairy man and Jacob was real smooth. So he put animal skins on him. His mother did. And so his father felt him and said, well, you don't sound like Esau, but you feel like Esau, which is a great lesson about not going by what you feel, but we won't get into that. <laughs> That's a little aside. And so then Jacob ran off and he was out in the desert and he saw a woman that he really wanted named Rachel and he asked Laban, her father, for her hand in marriage and he said, well, you can have her, but you have to work seven years for her. You work for me for seven years and then I'll give her to you. Well, at the end of the seven years, they had a wedding ceremony. Rachel, that he thought he was getting, had on a veil. They got him good and drunk and he woke up the next morning in his tent with her sister Leah. And the father said, well, you know, in our culture, the, the older sister, the oldest child has to be married first. So I'll give you Rachel too. You can have Leah and you can have Rachel But now you're going to have to work another seven years. So he worked another, another seven years. Are you noticing that Jacob is reaping what he sowed? Now he sure didn't like the way Laban was treating him. Trickster, swindler, cheat, liar. But he was all those things. I just don't think he realized it yet. It's amazing how we judge other people for the same things that we do or how so often we have something happening in our life and we've already sown seeds for it for 20 years but now we can't believe somebody's doing that to us. Now Jacob did eventually have his meeting with God and they got things straightened out but So he, now he, he worked his way out of this. He paid everything. And so he said to Laban, he said, I want to go and have my own place now and go off on my own and, and start my own life. And Laban said, oh, no, please, you know, you got to work for me. I've been blessed ever since you've been in my house. And so he said, you name your wages and I'll pay you whatever it is that you want me to pay you. And he said, I don't want you to pay me anything. But he said, here's, here's what I'd like to have. He said, I've been the keeper of your flock. And He said, if you will separate all the spotted and speckled she-goats and he-goats and all the black lambs, then those will be mine and you'll have everything else. So they would have both had a really nice crop. He, he agreed to do it. But then overnight, Laban snuck in again and he took out all of the black and white speckled and all of the the black sheep, so there was no way that he could breed 
black and white spotted animals because he didn't leave him any that were black and white spotted to breed. So the whole point was, was he was supposed to take this part of the herd and then breed it over a period of time. And he had the faith he would have built it up and become a wealthy man. But Laban put him in a position where it was impossible. Now, is everybody here? Put him in a position where it was impossible. But we know with God, all things are possible. So let us look at Genesis chapter 30. Talk about being creative. This guy was creative. And we'll start, I think, in verse 37, maybe. Genesis 30, 37. But Jacob took fresh rods of poplar and almond and plane trees and peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white in the rods. See, we are so creative. I had them make these for me. So, Jacob puts these spotted rods in front of these plain colored goats and sheep at the watering trough where they would breed. And every time they would come to drink, they would see these. And when it came time to breed, they would see these. So this was what was in their vision. And if you go ahead and read this, even though in the natural it was impossible because he kept the vision in front of them, they ended up giving birth. Solid colored animals gave birth to spotted and speckled animals. And the Bible goes on to say that he became an extremely wealthy man. And his flock grew and grew and grew and grew. And he even worked out this thing where, you know, he didn't, any of the weak ones, he didn't, he didn't breed them. He wouldn't put them in front of the weak ones. And so he let the weak ones that Laban was going to end up with that were all solid colors. They just had all kinds of them, but they were all sickly. And, but all the strong ones, he would put the vision in front of them and say, now this is what you're, I don't care what you are now, this is what you're going to be. And can I tell you that that's what God's saying to you? I don't care what you are now. This is what you're going to be. God's got a vision for your life. You are a new creature in Christ. All things have passed away and all things become brand new. Amen? <coughs> I bet I could raffle off my poles, couldn't I? I should sell those dudes and make money to feed the poor. You need to keep a dream in front of you. You need to keep a vision in front of you. And not just once, but over and over. Every time they'd come to drink. I mean, they got to the point where all they could see was spots and speckles. How could you produce anything else if that's all you're seeing? Spots and speckles, spots and speckles, black and white, black and white, spots and speckles, spots and speckles. Sure enough, when it came time to give birth, spots and speckles, there they come. The impossible happens when you get into the spirit realm with God and dream. There's creativity in your spirit. Did you hear me? There's a realm that we're not used to living in. We know it's there, but we kind of, sort of, don't know if we really believe it or not. We don't really know how to function there very much. Even like tonight, you know, when I got that thank you thing on me, it was like, that was something happening in the spirit in me. I could not, I mean, I, there's lots of things I'm thankful for, but there wasn't anything in particular on my mind right then. I didn't have any intention of saying that when I came up, but that was what was coming out of my spirit. We need to learn how to live more in the spirit. And I don't understand it. I don't know what it was all about, but it sure made me feel good. And something got accomplished in the spiritual realm. What do you see for your life? What are you looking at? What do you see? Ooh. Well, you need to see something. <laughs> you young people need to see something for your future. You need to see something better than what you've been used to. Maybe you had a a great mom and dad, but maybe you didn't. Maybe your mom and dad wasn't so great. Well, you know what? You don't have to worry about it because you're not your mother and you're not your father. You're you. 
You're you. A whole new generation. A whole new creature. Another group of scriptures that I really love are Genesis chapter 13. All of these things just make such a good case for what I'm trying to share tonight. Verse 2, Abram was extremely rich in livestock, silver, and gold. Extremely. <laughs> I like extreme words. Long story short, his nephew Lot was with him, Abram and Lot. And they both had cattle, and they both had herds. And strife got between not the two of them, but their employees. Strife got between their employees. But Abram had such a revelation on strife. He knew that strife was a killer. He knew it was like a spiritual cancer. He knew that if that strife stayed, that it would grow and that it would eventually get between the two of them. And he knew that if they were in strife and fighting and arguing and didn't have agreement, that God couldn't bless them. Oh, Lord, if we would just know that in our world today. So many people cannot have the plan of God for their life because they're always mad at somebody. Do you have any idea how many mad Christians there are? I mean, you may have even come here tonight with somebody you're mad at. Well, it's the truth. Dave and I used to go to church mad all the time. But boy, when we got to the front door, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, how are the Myers? Fine. Praise the Lord. We're just fine. Amen. Then get in the car and fight all the way home and wonder, wonder how the devil was getting in. Hello? I mean, seriously, do you know how many Christians are mad at something or somebody? Angry, bitter, resentful? I mean, probably more than aren't, if you want to know the truth. And if you're going to stay out of strife, you're going to have to work at it. And Abram was aggressive. He went to Lot and he said, look, let there be no strife between your herdsmen and my herdsmen. I'll tell you what, there's not enough grass here for all of us anymore. And that's what they were fighting about. They'd been so blessed that there wasn't enough grass for all of them. And so they were fighting over whose cattle was going to get to eat the grass. And Abram said, you pick whichever part of the Jordan Valley that you want and I'll take what's left. Well, you would think that Lot would have had enough sense to say, oh no, you know, you, you didn't even have to bring me with you. Everything I have is a result of you blessing me. No, you take what you want and I'll take what's left. But no, he went right in and the Bible says that he took the best part of the Jordan Valley for himself. So Abraham now doesn't have much left to look at. Verse 14. Genesis 13, 14. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had left him, oh, I want you to get this. Lift up now your eyes and look from the place where you are. <laughs> he didn't say stare at what you got and look at how nothing it is. He said, lift up your eyes and look away from the place where you are. North, south, east and west for all the land which you see I will give to you what do you see I'm asking you what you see and don't just sit around and see something for yourself that's part of it see yourself prosperous see yourself successful but you know I see myself feeding one million hungry children every day I got a long way to go, but I see it, and every year we're inching up on it a little bit at a time. And if I really do the math, I'm thinking, you know, I really won't live that long, but you know what? I'm going to keep pressing toward it. What do you see? You're miserable if all you see is something for yourself. You got to get some vision to help some people. Amen? God told Abraham, I will bless you and I will make you a blessing. It's got to come to you and through you. If all you're going to be is a reservoir, a collection station, then you'll only get so much and God won't give you any more. But if you let it flow through you, more will keep coming to you. What do you see? 
And I will make your descendants like the dust of the earth, so that if a man could count the dust of the earth, then could your descendants also be counted. Arise, walk through the land, the length of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it to you. Hallelujah. So basically, I think it's safe to say you can have all you can see. Amen? Now, in Genesis 15, still with Abram, God just told him he was going to have so many descendants he couldn't even count them. He didn't even have a child. Like, cool, God, how are you going to pull that off? God promised him a child. He got in the flesh, tried to do it his own way because things weren't moving along fast enough. Twenty years it took for this dream to come to pass. Twenty. And it was impossible. When God said to him, I'm going to give you a child from your own body, he was a hundred years old. And to put it plainly, his wife had already had to change a life. The Bible is nice about it. It was no longer the way with Sarah that it is with women. <laughs> I'm just putting it plain. She'd already had to change a life. And she was old, about 90. So, <laughs> Abram's in his tent <laughs> with Sarah. <laughs> and he hears God calling. Oh, yes, Abram, I'm going to give you a child from your own body. He's in this tent. He looks at Sarah. <laughs> the Bible says he looked at his own body which was as good as dead <laughs> he's just like same old same old yeah someday you're gonna get it someday you're gonna have a lot of descendants yeah look at her look at me life's passed us by I'm sick and tired of this tent I'm sick and tired of waiting I'm tired of this whole thing okay now watch <laughs> Isn't God so much fun? <laughs> oh, somehow I got into Exodus. That won't work. <laughs> I must have got excited in my tent. <laughs> okay, now watch, 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 watch. You got to see this. All right, let's put up Genesis 15. We're going to just read this whole thing, make the devil really mad. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not. Isn't that the first thing God always says to us? Fear not. For I am your shield, your abundant compensation, and your reward shall be exceedingly great. Another one of those lovely words. And Abram said, Well, Lord, what can you give me since I'm going from this world childless? And he who shall be the owner and the heir of my house is this steward, Eliezer, of Damascus. Well, God, what can you do for me? I'm just all but dead, and everything I've got is going to go to this steward here. I don't even have a kid. And Abraham continued, Now look, God, you've given me no child, and a servant born in my house is my heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man shall not be your heir, but he who shall come from your own body shall be your heir. And I'm sure that, you know, he's in here going, man, I'm a hundred. Sarah's 90. She's had to change a life. Things aren't working right anymore, God. I don't think that this is going to work. And look here. <laughs> Come on now, here it comes. And he brought him outside his tent and told him to look at the stars and count them. You know what the message is? Sometimes you got to get outside your tent. You got to get some new perspective. You got to go somewhere. You got to get by yourself. You got to do a little dreaming. You got to get a little vision. You can't just stay in same old, same old, same old, dealing with problem, 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 problem. Go take a walk. <laughs> Go.
Get outside your tent. If you're a mom with five kids, go lock yourself in the bathroom and run every source of water in there. And when the kids knock on the door, act like you can't hear them. <laughs> Have a bubble bath. Eat a cookie, buy a pair of shoes, do something radical. Come on. Isn't that cool? I mean, just imagine, 20 years. He's 100, she's 90. Oh, yeah, I'm, you're going to have a baby. <laughs> because with God, all things, all things, all things are possible. And you know what? You're either going to catch hold of this tonight, and you're going to go with it, and you're going to run your race to finish, or you're going to spend the rest of your life doing nothing but feeling sorry for yourself and attending one pity party after the other, sitting around depressed with all your depressed friends who want to do nothing but talk about everything that's not working right in their life. But if you want to, you can come outside your tent and you can look up for your redemption draweth not. And you can count the stars and say, I'm going to do what God says that I can do. I don't care how long it takes. I'm not quitting. I'm not giving up. I'm going to have a vision. Here's the thing. Let's just finish up with this, and we'll pick this up tomorrow night. Hebrews 11, 11, it says, By faith, Sarah conceived and delivered a child. You, you know... <laughs> You can give birth to anything by faith, but not if you can't conceive it. A woman can't give birth if she can't conceive. When a woman becomes pregnant, they say she has conceived. But if you look that word up, it's a very interesting word. It means to become pregnant with, to form in your mind, or to think or imagine. Goals and dreams are seeds in the spirit realm, and we can't give birth until we conceive that God can do that through us or in us. How totally, completely ridiculous it was of me 30 years ago to believe that I could go all over the world and preach the gospel. How completely, totally, utterly ridiculous and foolish. I didn't have the personality for it. I didn't have the voice for it. I didn't have any money. I didn't have any friends. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know how to do anything. I didn't have enough education. But I saw it. Many times I've had to come outside my tent and look at the stars. <laughs> Many times I've had to get off somewhere and get some fresh perspective. And You get weary. You get tired. You get tired of the fight. You get tired of judgmental, critical people. You get tired of somebody always trying to hassle you when all you're trying to do is do what you think is right. And you all know that. But when you feel like you're going under for the third time, you say, I'm getting out of my tent. I'm going to go get me some perspective. I'm going to let the fresh wind of God blow on me. And for many of you, I believe this weekend is going to do that for you. Well, I would like to encourage you today to always have a goal for your future. Have a dream, something that you want to see happen. We sometimes say, do you have a vision for your life? And it just means, do you have something in your heart that you want to see happen? I believe that really God has created us to be goal-oriented. I think we always need to have something that we're reaching for. So let me ask a question. What do you see for yourself? What do you want out of life? Don't get discouraged in your waiting time because things do take time. But just remember some of the things that God has done for you in the past, some of the things that he's done for other people, and remember that he will do it again. So keep that dream out in front of you and keep walking toward it and don't get discouraged.